All right, there are a lot of people that, that have a, don't have a problem with Jesus being a great example or a teacher, great teacher, even doing amazing miracles. But when he starts talking about being God, they have a problem with that. I mean, there are some people that deny that he ever said he was God. It's in there, believe me. It's in Luke, for sure. But it's in, in all these places. In fact, what he did right here, he's declaring who he is. Still, there are some people that, that deny him. But some people think that whenever the Christianity comes so narrow, and I heard one pastor say that someone once asked him if he was one of those narrow-minded ministers that, that only be, that believe that only people from his church went to heaven mm -hmm. and he said well i'm even more narrow-minded to that because i have a feeling a lot of them aren't going to make it <laughs> that's how narrow-minded i am <laughs> all right so we're going to talk about this tonight number one message for those who have faith they brought to him a paralytic lying on the bed and again he is left Gadara. He has left the demoniac, totally transformed. He comes back here to Capernaum, and people have heard that he is coming, and he is in the midst of a crowd, and this <clears throat> crowd is blocking the way to him, and so you have four men who bring this paralytic to him. Tradition says that this man was paralyzed because of an STD sexually transmitted disease for some of y'all who don't know what that means that's Jewish tradition that he had gotten I don't want to get too elaborate but syphilis or something like that and it had uh, caused him problems which explains why he's of the demeanor and why Jesus approaches him the way he approaches him the gospel of Mark said that when they came to this crowded house that they actually removed part of the roof to get him in and lowered him down in front of Jesus. I can just see the guy lowering down, lowering down. He gets right in front of Jesus. How you doing? How you doing? And you put him right on the ground, all the way from the top. And can you imagine Jesus teaching and all of a sudden they're, they're starting to claw through the, the ceiling and you know stuff starting to fall in all different directions? <laughs> Jesus kept going. Didn't have a problem with it. He was like, finally we got somebody that I'm here for. While well, the rest of them were of all different persuasions. The crowds were there because they were excited to see him. Jewish leaders were there because they were checking out what he was doing. And now he's actually got somebody connected with faith that is entering the room in a very strange way, but he's coming in the room. Anyway, because of the crowd, they couldn't get to him. Now, the rooftops, <coughs> they... A lot of lounging was done up on the, the rooftop in these, these houses. And they have either walkways or ladders that would get them up there, which would have been kind of hard if you're carrying a guy on a stretcher to get him up to the, to the roof. But they get him up there, and you, know, you might think, be careful about inviting the preacher to your house for lunch because people may be clawing through the roof and damaging your home. But it, it, that would have been costly to knock a hole in the roof. But they were that desperate to get this man to Jesus. And, you know, that's the kind of people that you want in your life. How willing are you to get somebody to Jesus? They were willing to do this. They had all these barriers. Now, how much work was it? Not just to bring him there, but to take him up to the roof and then to cause the damage and probably they're going to have to fix the damage. You know, maybe our faith is seen in how far out on the limb we're willing to go to put people around us in a place where God can be faithful and change their lives. Jesus said he saw their faith. He saw their faith. Seeing their faith, Jesus spoke because of what he was seeing. Uh, you think about, you know, our religious things that we do is very visible. How visible is your faith? How visible is your faith to people? Is anybody seeing your faith? Because faith is what we do based on what we believe. And it should be visible if it's the right kind of faith. And because of what God wants for our lives, we by faith are going to choose to live differently. 
We are going to have different priorities every day. We're going to make different choices as we go through the day because of our faith. We're going to choose to put God and others first and live for kingdom needs rather than our own personal needs. And we're going to take time to grow spiritually in the Word of God and in the presence of God through prayer. If faith is visible in our lives. Oswald Chambers said, we do not, we pray not to receive answers to our prayers, but we pray because it makes us one with him. It makes us visible, it makes God visible in our lives. Yeah, you know, I can remember back in the, the 80s, and uh, I remember talking about this before, but I ended up in a church where faith was very visible. We often had more people on Sunday nights in that church than on Sunday mornings. Definitely had more decisions that were made. It would just cross the auditorium. I mentioned this before. And they would go one to after another, and they would ask them why they came tonight. And they would, rarely they said of a staff member, they would say, well, my neighbor, my friend, my coworker, they invited me, they witnessed to me. My, you know, they, they're the reason I'm here tonight. Because the church members' faith was visible out in the communities, in workplaces. And it was aggressive, exciting, and faith was visible everywhere. And God was, was blessing that. You know, there's a, there's a difference between two or three hired guns and two or three thousand satisfied customers. The world sees that, that differently. That's why the church is, is so important as it goes out into the, into the culture. Well, Jesus saw the faith of these four men because of their persistent commitment to bring their friend to Jesus. They were willing to do whatever it took. And it takes a lot of faith to knock a hole in a, in a roof in order to get your friend in front of Jesus. And that's what, they were, that's what they were willing to do. Luke says, and in contrast to these four guys, there were others there. In Luke chapter 5, it says, Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching, there were Pharisees, teachers of the law, sitting by who had come out of every town in Galilee and, and in Jerusalem. Jesus, they were here and the crowds were coming, and now you've got this team of religious leaders investigating what was going on. Now supposedly, sources say there were about 6,000 Pharisees. These aren't priests. These are a different thing. 6,000 Pharisees during the time of Jesus. Pharisees were the conservatives to the Sadducees who were the, the liberals. They would become some of Jesus' most bitter and hateful enemies. But here they are sitting there probably on the front row. Just a critical, setting themselves up as the standard of how things should be said and done watching to make sure everything was done like it's supposed to. But, you know, after it mentions them, there's this strange tagged phrase. It talks about the Pharisees, that they come out of every town of Galilee, Judah, Judea, and Jerusalem, and then it says this, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Not him, the one that's coming through the roof, them in the context of the Pharisees. This could have been their day also. They already had a good seat. This is in Luke where it says that. And some who think they are good might have the greatest needs in the building. Quote, unquote, good. They're more worried about this guy. They didn't know that power was there to heal them. Their spiritual needs as well. Someone said the deadliest sin of all is the quiet conscience, the person who believes that they have no sin. Quiet conscience. It's not challenging you. J.I. Packard said we are all invalids in God's hospital. In moral and spiritual terms, we are all sick and damaged, diseased and deformed. Scarred and sore, lame and lopsided to a far, far greater extent than we realize. But there's power there to heal. It's 
So, message for those who have faith, before we brought him. A message for those who have sin as well. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven. He just, he just leapfrogged over the problem. How big a problem could you have? Nothing bigger than being paralyzed. And it's like, why did you come? Oh, your sins are forgiven. If I was a paralytic, I'd say, wait, wait, wait. I got another problem here. Obviously, because they had to knock a hole in the, the ceiling just to get me down in front of you. So he, Jesus starts with the inner rather than the outer problem. How should I kill the doctor? You got a broken bone, you got pneumonia. The doctor sits you down and he says, you know what? Your sins are forgiven. Says, what are you talking about? I came here because I'm sick. What must have gone through the paralytic's mind as well as the mind of his friends? We didn't bring him here for that. But Jesus has this way of, of identifying what the main problem is in a person's life. With the rich young ruler, he knew it was covetousness. With the scribe, he knew that it was comfort and that he wasn't going to be willing to go where foxes, you know, they have their holes and the birds of the air have nests. Son of man, no place to lay his head. When he said that, he went the other way because Jesus identified that. But, you know, we spend a lot of time praying for the physical needs of folks. And if we were really looking through God's eyes, we might be praying a lot more for the spiritual needs of folks. Maybe God's using the physical in order to impact the spiritual, and we're trying to turn that spout off rather than pray with God about the spiritual needs. Um... And we often pray for folks that are rarely here. Maybe the fact that they're rarely here shows that we should probably pray for the spiritual more than the physical. I, I shouldn't have said that out loud, should I? But we need to pray that God would make us sensitive to the deeper needs so that we can pray in line. Because what we often think is our biggest need usually isn't because it's coming to the filter of our humanness. And the greatest need in a man's life is not paralysis, but sin. It's sin. You know, what good is it to go into eternity sound in body with a diseased soul? Remember, this man probably had, according to tradition, his paralysis because of a sin issue. And in the culture, the Jewish culture, they often equated sickness with sin. And if God's allowed this, then you're kind of no hope. You're no hope. You're not in the temple. You're not, God's not going to accept you. The number one thing that man needed to hear, that he was forgiven. That God hasn't rejected him because of this disease that came from a immoral way probably that God still loved him and he needed to hear that to be ready to receive what God wanted for his life because in order to get to the point where you're ready for God to touch you and heal you you need to be his child you need to be in the position of relationship with him to really have those kind of expectations well, here's a message also for those, not just for who have faith, sin, but also cynicism. He said, take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. Some of the scribes said to themselves, this fellow blasphemes. They've been waiting for their little nugget to go after him. There it was. That's what we came for, guys. He said it. Finally got the, the picture that all of the... Uh, what do they call those guys that chase you around? Not me around. What? Huh? Paparazzis. Did anybody else say that? I just didn't hear it. Oh, well, she didn't talk about it. Paparazzi. Yeah, they wait for that perfect picture. They can really distort or something. Um, these guys are waiting for the perfect thing. You know, the scribes, we talked about 
a little while back that they were experts in the Old Testament in the interpretations of theirs, traditional interpretations. But when Jesus said this, they were both right and wrong. Only God can forgive sin. They were right about that. But they were wrong because the Son of God was standing right before them. And they didn't know, and they should have known. If you search the scriptures, they shows you me. And they weren't seeing it. But they began reasoning. Luke says they began reasoning, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So forgiving sin is God's domain. They were right. It says in the Bible, you know, against, you know, David said, against Thee and thee only have I sinned. The sacrifices about sin are always made before God. So it's, it's all about God when you sin. So they were right. Who forgives but God alone? And they are saying this in their mind, under their breath. You know, where Jesus it says in verse 4, knowing their thoughts. Now that's, uh, that's not fair. He knows your thoughts. He said, why are you thinking evil in your heart? He not only saw into the hurting heart of the paralytic, but he saw into the skeptical hearts of these religious leaders. He knew their thoughts. And he knew the man's thought as well. So he throws his out to them, which is easier. To say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. Go in the hospital. Which is easier? Go room to room. Is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven, see you later, or get up and walk? You can say one, and you can just assume, well, you're not seeing the results of it. If you say the other, you're going to see the results. If it's a legitimate thing or not. So Jesus, you know, he said something only God can say, and now he's going to do something only God can do. So which is easier? For men, both are impossible. But both are equally impossible for God. For God, he can do both. To heal a man, he simply has to say a word. But to forgive a man, Jesus must die. Seems harder. But for God, it's equally as possible. Verse 6 is a message that uh, changes lives so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. One statement he uses, he impacts two groups. The religious leaders one way, and the crowds another. He says, get up. Get up and get going. That's all we need to do when he speaks into our life. I mean, which way are you going? When he... He doesn't say go to the pew. Which way are you going in your life? Because Jesus has healed you, called you to a life to get up and get going. Pick up your bed. You know, others have been carrying you along for years, but when somebody is really saved and their life is turned around, they will stand up and they'll start picking people up. Carrying that bed that they've been leaning on all this time, they're going to you know, take their part of it now as well. They're going to start being part of the church. Start helping out. And then go home because your greatest testimony are those people who knew you when. That's your best testimony. And that's where you start. Others may know you afterwards and think, assume that you were just this angel all, all your life. You can snow them, but the people that knew you when, they can see how different you are. So he tells this man, how different does a paralytic look when he's up and walking and carrying his mat? I mean, what a built-in testimony that is. Verse 7 says he got up and he went home. That's it. That's seven words. If I had been Matthew, I would have been writing stuff. I would have been writing how his face changed. I would have been writing how he started to twitch. I've been writing how he pushed himself up and looked around and all the crowd, how the expressions changed and what his friends looked like. And I would have just really milked this. Matthew just says he got up and went home. Just easy as that. 
But he does tell us how the crowd reacted, which uh, they, uh, says the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. There's something different when the crowds in our lives begin to give glory to God because of what they're singing in us. And they can see a lot of stuff that we do that religious religious people do and they not give glory to God, but when they have the unexplainable as part of our life, that causes them to give glory that way rather than this way. And that's what the crowd did because who is this? This is what Jesus has been getting. What kind of man is this? The wind and the waves obey him. And that's what the crowds are asking right now. Such a big production with a ceiling and everything and a confrontation with the Pharisees and really setting it up and then boom, he's up. So what do you learn from this? Number one, seek out Jesus regardless of the shame or significance of your condition. He wasn't afraid in spite of how his condition occurred and how bad it was. Find someone to help on their journey to Jesus and not just be the paralytic, but be the guys who helped him. Remember who Jesus is and what is possible. And listen for his call. Be willing to move in ways that seem impossible. You see, there were a few things at work, like this little perfect storm, spiritual storm. Number one, Luke said in verse 17 of chapter 5, there was power there in that room to heal. That's what I pray for on Sunday mornings, that there's power here for something to happen. That means somebody's been praying, somebody's been leaving. But in this situation, like those crowds were pumped. Jesus' disciples had seen things happen on the, on the, in the boat out in the middle of the lake. They have seen what had happened in Gadara with the demoniac. There was faith in this room. And it was described as power to heal. And also, Jesus said, seeing their faith, there was faith there to receive the power that was there. You got the power here. Nobody has the faith to receive it. Exhaustive supply. Never get tapped into. But then there was established a relationship out of which to receive. Your sins are forgiven. Now that the big thing's out of the way. Now that the relationship is established between you and God. Now you're his child. There's power here. There's faith here. And now there's the right recipient that is here as well. And then there was a willingness in Jesus to act in accordance to the faith he saw. That means that everything that was happening was in accordance to the will of God of the moment. That's why the word of God is so key, that we know the will of God in the moments. But the power was there. The faith was there. The recipient was now right for the miracle and it was in accordance with the will of God so Jesus was willing to act faith grounded in God's will releases God's power it's pretty simple faith grounded in God's will releases God's power alright folks